It's never been easier to get on the water with Academy Sports and Outdoors. Stop by your local Academy store or online at academy.com today and shop great gear from fishing's top brands like Luz, Zebco, Abu Garcia, Shimano, and more. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Spring Redfish on the Fly, and we're going to be talking to Captain Seth Vernon of Double Hall Guide Service out of the Wrightsville Beach area. Our topics are going to include proper equipment, tides, what to look for, how to approach, and then we're going to finish with some etiquette. I'm Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now in this latest and greatest chapter, the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. And it is in this series that we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insights, their knowledge on how to catch more fish more often. And our hope is that this information excites you, it empowers you, and that you get out, you get you and your family and friends out on the water to spend more time on the water more often. And I'm joined in this endeavor. I'm joined just as I am in every episode with my podcast partner, Billy Thorpe of Co-Pilot Studios, a studio for hire service provider. Billy, hey man. How you doing? What's up, Gary? I'm doing good, man. You doing all right? I am, and I'm guessing that you're excited because I'm excited, man. Fly fishing is my it's my my jam, or I like to think it is anyway. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> I was gonna say it if you didn't. <laughs> Whatever, Gary. The only fish I've seen you catch on a fly. No, I'm not gonna get into it. I won't go there. Was the one fish you didn't catch <laughs> on the, the fly? Was the fish I didn't catch? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I'm still bitter a little bit about that sh- about that shad fishing trip. I couldn't tell. Whatever. I actually cast my fly rod and just will it out the back of the boat. Anyway, Stop. I'm not going to You're making yourself look worse, Billy. We got to move on. Whatever, Gary. What are we moving on to? I already forgot. I already forgot. We are not talking about yeah. how to watch, how to listen no. anymore. We do Don't. stab in there and say, hey, we would love for you to subscribe. Subscribe is free. We would love for you to do that. We're not numbers driven, but we hey, still want a number you to is a number. Subscribe, and right? it's free. Right so on. We're just not going to tell you where to do that. And th- <laughs> <laughs> just make it tough on you. If you, if you don't know by now, we want intelligent right subscribers <laughs> that can problem solve. You can Google Fisherman's Post podcast <laughs> and figure, find out where we're at. <laughs> well, I think what you're going to do is you're going to introduce a one of our newer sponsors, and yeah. then we're going to our tried and true Marine Warehouse Center. Yeah, is that right? Did I get that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So one of our newer sponsors is R. A. Hitch of Raleigh Apex area. I mean, Chris and his team do a lot of stuff as hitches, trailers, bike racks, trailer repairs, all kinds of stuff that uh, us as boating, I say us as boating people, you you, you elitist boaters can take advantage of. Um, and also, speaking of taking advantage, they're going to give $20 off uh, now through June 30th for anybody who comes in and mentions the podcast. And they have a very clean and easy to navigate website i checked it out man those guys are putting they have a great business going and so you don't have to be in the raleigh apex area you know go ahead shop online those guys are motivated they want to they're supporting the podcast they're supporting the community and we're asking you guys to support ra hitch for supporting us yeah and reach out to us i was like hey we're listeners of the podcast we love it want to help you guys out and so yeah man we appreciate chris and, and those guys over there just go check them out and then one of our, our, our longest sponsors, not one of our longest sponsors, our longest sponsor is Marine Warehouse Center. Got a message from them. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Robbie with Marine Warehouse Center in Wilmington and Charleston. We are headquarters for Pair Custom Boats. These center consoles are handmade in Washington, North Carolina, and are custom designed for fishing and family fun on the water. Right now, we have several models in stock, and deal times on the custom orders are around five months. These boats are custom built to fit your needs, from the seating, the tops, the leaning posts, and the live wheels. You design the entire layout of your boat. Come by and see for yourself why they're one of the fastest growing boat builders in the country. I love it every time. Dude, every time that music, man. I, I didn't. I just listened really. Well, I mean, I listened to that commercial several times now. But um, the 
custom boat that you designed. I didn't hear that part. I guess I learned something new every time, but I'm like, whoa, wait a second. I can go into the Marine Warehouse, hang out with those guys, and help design my own custom boat. Get on the website, and you can play with it, mm. see what's going to happen, see what yeah. the final product will look like. That's cool. Um, I'm going to need some. I'm gonna need a lot of people to buy me a coffee so I can go design You're going to need a lot of people to buy you a coffee. <laughs> and, um, I mean, when you go there, I would say look for Emmett. Terrell, man, he'll bog you down. He'll say, hey, man, let me tell you some jokes. <laughs> he's, he's still been doing that. He's still been doing that. He's consistent. I like consistency. Yeah, man. He's like, hey, hold on. It'll just be a second. I'm, I'm writing a letter in cursive writing, <laughs> and then I'm going to tell you a joke. And I was like, all right, Terrell, writing a letter in cursive. Okay. I didn't even know people wrote in cursive anymore, but I'll stick around because I'm sure it's a good joke. I'm not going to stick around just because you're a sponsor and I no, have to listen to these jokes. That, yeah. And boy, am I glad I stuck around and listened to it because it's a beaut. Are you ready? <laughs> Terrell's uh, joke. I've been waiting for this all week. What what game do fish play at parties? I, I don't know. Salmon says. <laughs> Salmon says. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No, that's in. <laughs> I'm, that, that's getting up. That's getting right. Yeah, there you go. Good job. Yeah, he'll be That's happy. Great. He'll be yeah. happy here that was well. So I think we're going to a fish photo. Here we go to the fish photo. And this is Bobby Holt with a 23-inch red drum caught on cut bait while fishing in the Ogden area. As I always say, I got to get a new line. That is a good-looking fish. <laughs> I'm too predictable, Gary. But, yeah, nice-looking fish. And, uh, yeah, I can't wait to learn how to catch more on a fly. Yeah, we're not going to be, be talking. I'm going to guess that we're not going to be talking about cut bait. No, I don't even know who put that picture in there. <laughs> <laughs> Who's on our pre-production staff? Oh, uh, huh, I don't. It was either you, fifty-fifty chance it was one of us. Well, I tell you what, man, we would do a. How about uh, how about our plug, Billy? Oh, our plug for buy me a coffee. That's exactly what I'm talking All about. All right. Well, let me bring it up on the screen so people will know what I'm talking about <laughs> if I can make it happen. Here we go. Buy me a coffee. You can go to buymeacoffee.com backslash fisherman's post. And uh, go support Gary and I personally as being creators. And it's a cool platform where you can support creators, podcasters, artists, all that stuff. Um, but once again, just go there for us. Don't worry about all the other people. <laughs> and, and buy Gary and I coffee and support our caffeine addiction. And I got a pitch, man. When you do buy us a coffee or a couple of coffees, send us a note. Tell us what you'd like to see in a podcast. Oh, yeah. Tell us a topic you'd like us to see us cover up here in the near future. Now, of course, we can't guarantee it because we don't know what kind of crazy stuff you would come up with. But I promise you we will look at it and try to make it happen. So note, when you do go to buy me a coffee, suggest either a topic or suggest a guest. Suggest a new talent for Gary, us. Gary, are you selling episodes right now? If you but we can't guarantee it unless we buy me fifty coffees <laughs> and then it'll have a better chance. No, well, I mean someone could put something stupid in there. That's what I was getting at. I'm like, hey, I think you should talk about the world record poop. <laughs> and then I'd be like, no, we I don't care how I, many coffees. I would never talk about that. Well, I won't that. say you couldn't buy me enough coffees to do it, but it would be a whole it would be a whole lot. Oh, um, okay. Transitioning out. Billy, since we are talking fly fishing and since you imagine yourself to be a fly fisherman, then I am really have high expectations. Yeah, that was a dig. I have high expectations for Billy's best <laughs> takeaway. All right, I'm ready. All right, well, let's go to our guest, our special guest tonight, Captain Seth Vernon of Double Hall Guide Service out of the Riceville Beach area, and we are going to be talking spring redfish on the fly. Welcome to the show, Seth. A pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thanks, Gary. It's great being here with you and Billy. You guys cracked me up. <laughs> Well, all right, that's one. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're got, making we one person laugh. Yeah, it's perfect. Well, Seth Vernon of Double Hall Guide Service, as is tradition on this show, we've got two questions for you before we can begin with the main event of Spring Redfish on the Fly. Are you ready for your two questions? I'm ready. Hit me. Question number one. Why should we listen to anything you have to say about saltwater fly fishing? Why should we keep watching, keep listening? Uh, some people would say you probably shouldn't, uh, because you're going to go down the rabbit hole after we get done with this, you're going to sell all your spinning rods, your bait casters, you're going to go in deep with fly and get really frustrated. Uh, but the truth is I've got over 22 years experience as a professional fly fishing guide. And that experience covers everything from Alaska, the American West, uh, Western North Carolina, which is beautiful up in the blue Ridge, 
and here in Wilmington since 2004. That's pretty impressive, Billy. Gary, this is uh, not, not happens very often, but I'm going to go ahead and take over this interview. No. <laughs> what buttons do I press? What I'm button? out. Hey, I'm in control here. See ya. <laughs> well, Seth Vernon, question number two, as is tradition, is a non-fishing-related question. And so, you know, I looked at our fly fishing topic to come up with this question. So as far as, um, how am I going to word this? Your favorite character TV film that carries a magic wand. Your favorite TV movie character that carries a magic wand. I got multiple choice for you. You don't even have to think of them. Oh, would I it have be, one. Okay. Would it be A, Gandalf, B, the fairy godmother in Cinderella, C, Tinkerbell, or D, Harry Potter? Oh, Tinkerbell all the way. <laughs> hey, magic wand, is that derogatory to a fly fisherman? No, not at all. Um, some people probably refer to that as the magic wand. Okay. I mean, we joke about the skiff being a magic carpet ride. All right. I mean, I was kind of hoping it was derogatory, but okay. Your answer works too. Now let's go to the main event, Seth. I wanna, I'm want i excited about spring fly fishing, especially since in our one of our quick conversations sort of leading up to the show, you were talking, you know, in just a minute, told me about the advantages that it gives you, and especially in the springtime. But let's talk. Let's go through the talking points. Proper equipment. So if I'm if I'm fancy and spring red fish on the fly, please get me started with the proper equipment. Okay. So my first rule with this is, don't go crazy with a, a super expensive outfit. You can go to most any tackle shop uh, in your local community and here at the coast and test drive a fly rod, and you should, um, and you should have a good experience doing that. Buying the equipment. Um, spend the most money that you can afford today. If you're going to keep that equipment. It's going to last a long, long time. And most of the companies offer a lifetime warranty these days, specifically if you're targeting redfish or sea trout and flounder, which are your big three inshore species, I highly recommend an eight weight. You're going to want that eight weight geared in a nine foot length. And you'll want to put floating fly line on that. And you'll have a leader which we can talk a little bit more about. We'll keep that brief. And the leader is the invisible mono or fluorocarbon that you're going to use to attach your fly to the fly line. So you have backing, which is like insurance on your reel, fly line, which helps you cast the fly rod, helps to load it up. And then you have the terminal end, which can be anywhere from seven and a half to 16 feet long, depending on the application. All right. I love follow-up questions. And so I'm going to hit you with all of them. Why eight weight? Why nine foot? Why floating line? Certainly. So the length is what is going to allow you to achieve the distance that you want. When I was guiding in the western part of North Carolina in the mountains, especially small wild trout streams, we would often use seven and a half foot rods. And there were times that you would be in really tight quarters and you would need to make what we call a bow and arrow cast where you actually hold the rod and the line and you shoot it like a bow and arrow. And in really tight quarters, we might take that seven and a half foot rod and break it into two pieces to make it even smaller. Out here on the coast, you're battling wind. You're going to need to cast long distances. Sometimes you want to reposition the fly line with the different multiplying currents and effects of tide, your trout fishing. And that nine foot length is going to give you more advantages for all of those um, challenges that you're going to face as a fly angler on the coast. And then eight weight, is that a good all around setup for a little bit heavier? I mean, a little bit bigger, a little bit lighter. Is yes. that why the eight weight? The eight weight is a great choice uh, just to kind of give you a reference. Uh, the same way that you would choose a shotgun for certain game, we choose the fly rod weight for certain species. So I have a 17 weight that I use for Marlin. I've got 11 weights that I use for tarpon. I've got eight weights that are going to do a full gamut of enjoyment out of Spanish, albacore, speckled trout, flounder, redfish, which tend to be one of my favorites. We're going to talk about that, obviously. Uh, but you could also chase mahi-mahi with an eight weight. And if you were to pick a destination, you could go after bonefish or snook or baby tarpon. Uh, if you just want to get out and practice on a windy day when you can't get out on the coast, you can turn around and target largemouth bass. And that eight weight 
is kind of like from a fly fishing standpoint using the shotgun analogy it's like a 12 gauge it'll do so many things really well i've got one more follow-up question and uh and then we can move on to the tides or if i'll i'll set you up to see if you have anything else to say about proper equipment so if i am trying out a fly rod in the parking lot or outside the shop what is it that um you know i'm what is it that I'm looking for? What is it, what is it that I'm hoping to experience that lets me know, yeah, this is the one? Yeah. So a lot of times when I'm teaching fly casting instruction, we're talking about line feel. Uh, the, the three main things that I'm looking for is the ease of loading of that fly rod. And I want to know where my fly line is at all times, whether it's behind me on the back cast unfurling or you know transitioning forward and so some rods will feel very damp or soft and they won't transfer a lot of line feel your traditional light tackle enthusiasts would relate a high modulus spinning rod i'm sure some of the other captains have talked about this for trout having a real um, stiff tip to be able to feel that nuanced bite that is similar to line feel you want to have a good connection with the fly line and you shouldn't be in the parking lot throwing your arm and shoulder out of socket and needing rotator cuff surgery. You should be able to do this with relative ease. And the boundaries that you're trying to break through from a fishing standpoint or casting in your distances is going to be between 30 and 50 feet. And we can talk more about this, but I don't typically want to see my English casting beyond 50 feet for a variety of reasons. All right. Um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm aware of, you know, even my question about floating line, I suspected I was getting ahead of myself there with that and that we were going to be able to cover that once we're on the water. Um, I have in my notes tied. So unless you have anything else to share with proper equipment, you're free to, we're free to yeah, move sure, on to tides. We'll, we'll move on to tides. The reason that we're using a floating line specifically in this uh, endeavor chasing redfish is we're going to be in shallow water. And as most of the people that have fished, the coast know you've got a lot of clams and oysters and sharp objects and we even have some more debris in the water these days from past hurricanes that floating line is going to keep your line above all of those hazards so you're not taking a 90 dollars fly line that sinks burying it down into an oyster bed and just tearing it to pieces and um, making it vulnerable to breaking um, that's pretty easy to grasp. I, I can I see yeah. that logic ab immediately. So we're focusing on more of a skinny water. So in springtime, when you're targeting redfish, we're talking more skinny water. And and so what do I need to know? What do I need to know about tides if I'm trying to pull off a redfish on the fly in the springtime? That's a great question, Gary. The key to this whole uh, nuance of targeting redfish in in shallow water with fly is we want the warmest portion of the day. And if you can get that in concert with lower tides. So if I could look at the tide predictions, whether you're using an app on your phone or an old school tide chart, I want to see a low tide somewhere between 10 and three o'clock, much earlier or much later. And I'm not going to have the sunlight at a high enough angle to see through the water with polarized glasses to sight fish the schooling fish that we're targeting or my guests aren't going to be able to see them very well. Uh, and furthermore, that time frame is going to be the warmer part of the day. And the fish are going to feed more actively and in greater concentrations around the low tide. So warmer water, fish in a barrel, we hope, big schools kind of congested into safe water that is shallow, free of dolphins and possibly other predators like us. Uh, and typically that water is going to warm up quicker through the day than the surrounding deeper waters that you might find in say a yacht basin, um, fishing for other species. So this brings to mind, you know, we've been talking about spring, so maybe we need to define spring. Cause what I'm sitting here thinking of like how late into the season does, do we worried about the middle of the day, low tide? I mean, I understand about having sun and that would be no matter the water temp, but is there a water temp where middle of the day is now, no longer optimal? Uh, so in my experience, the hotter the water, often the better the redfish activity. Uh, fished in places in South Carolina that are retired rice ditches and taking water readings that day, the water was 96 degrees and they were feeding on shrimp, 
uh, with a fervor that rivals anything that we've seen up here. So the water temperature being hot is not necessarily an issue, but it's those cooler nights. So when I think spring, we're just a few days past the first day of spring, we still have some cool nights. Uh, we still have some cold nights, uh, especially in March. And those fish are starting to transition from their, some of them, their winter haunts in the surf zones around our inlets and into those backcountry waters. I would say the main reason that I'm finding these fish up shallow is that is where the birds are because that is where the bait is most prolific and therefore that is where I'm finding the redfish and the tide helps you to do that. What I mean by that is if the tide was really high and you're sight fishing and throwing the fly, which is really best done in say three feet of water or less, if you're fishing on a high tide, those fish may be less concentrated, more scattered throughout an area and they're going to be harder to see because of the deeper water. And so is moving water at all a factor? Like if you're at dead low, is that a little bit slower than at least a little bit of move either on the fall or on the rise around the low tide? So that's a terrific question. Yes. Um, slack tides, when the tide is actually done falling or rising and it's completely kaput, that's a really tough time to get a bite. Everything starts to transition or mellow out. I find personally some of the best fishing that we experience in spring with cooler water temperatures is on the last two to three hours of the falling tide. And the way that we make a day out of that is there are certain areas that are going to hold like uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, the right amount of water when even though the tide prediction says it's mid-tide, there's an area that's holding redfish that we can only access at mid-tide, but it's a foot deep. And then on the outgoing tide towards low, I'm still in a foot of water when that area that we previously fished at mid-tide, which only held a foot of water, is now dry. So it begins to be a little bit like a chess game of locating and knowing where fish are and moving the skiff and the anglers around in concert with the pulse of that tide so that you're incessantly fishing in a foot to 18 inches of water, good sight fishing conditions, hopefully a, an environment that is very flats oriented, which just gives you a better target zone. They're not going to slide off to deep water and evade you. Um, and making sure that you can see those fish in the shallow water. So everyone wants to know the question where, I mean, that is a constant, no matter what we're talking about or who's asking. And so, you know, in my mind, certainly there are some people in the Wrightsville beach area and your waters that are watching this, but man, you know, we're up and down the coast and we're beyond North Carolina. So maybe speak a little bit for the optimum habitat you're talking about here. You know, from sure. what I gather, we're talking about, Creeks, we're talking about skinny creeks, and we're talking about creeks with some areas of flats. Is that right? Right. So if you were to just look at an aerial photograph uh, or an actual nautical chart of the inshore marshes, whether that be Moorhead or Charleston or the Keys or here, what you're going to find with redfish, one of the things that they love are crescent-shaped bays with a shallow bottom. It helps if there's a mix of Spartina bordering that area and some soft mud and some oyster because that's just a good ecosystem balance of habitat for bait and other food forage for the fish. But if you find a crescent shaped bay, and you can see this in an aerial or a Google Earth, bordered by deeper water creek that gets a consistent tidal flow. The fish are gonna use that deep creek at low tide when there's less tidal flow and they don't have to spend much effort capturing prey. And then when the tide pushes in, they're going to move up onto that flat lagoonish style basin. At least that's the case around here. And those crescent shaped bays, I believe afford the fish more opportunities to pursue their prey at a variety of different directions of wind. So if it was just a South facing bank, they can only move one way and back on a north wind. But if it's a north facing bank and it's kind of flat, it'd be pretty easy for a dolphin to push up there and whack them 
And again, they, they can always orient themselves to catching prey in that area on a south blow. So a nice crescent shaped bay uh, that has a little bit of an elliptical shape to it that's not dead set in the middle of a hard charging tide because redfish are kind of lazy. They'll ride the tide in, they'll ride the tide out, but they don't want to be like a speckled trout where they're sitting in that current and fighting for calories. And so they want some deep water close by. Is that, is that a form of function or just a form of a sense of safety? Or is it, I mean, I'm, I mean, this is great. I'm loving this redfish education. I'm, I'm asking for more. I think a big part of it is they need a safe zone. Um, if they're living in a flats environment and we get a hard southwest blow on our coast, we see a negative impact on our tides. In other words, a hard southwest blow here is going to reduce the low. It's going to make it lower and it's going to reduce the high. And these fish are intelligent enough or have enough natural programming in their DNA not to want to be stranded high and dry. And I would, I would challenge anybody to show me where they found redfish just high and dry. They don't do that. They fall back to deeper water. Um, but I, I do believe that it's more function, Gary. I think these fish are using the flats for their feeding and then falling back to deeper waters when necessary. Uh, within their comfort limits so that they're not stranded at high tide. I mean, they've got to eat and they've got to breathe. So they need water, they need warmth to metabolize the food that they eat, and they need food. Um, they're going to almost always be, especially in our environment here, with the rapid uh, change in tides. We have a pretty great change in tides when you compare it to equatorial tides like the Keys where they get a foot. You know, we average four. They need some deep water safety nearby. So what else? And when you were giving me the note of what to look for, is was this the conversation or is there something else I should be setting us up to talk about? No, that's great. Thank you for setting that up. The other thing that I would look for other than geography is life. Life begets life. So traditionally, if we're fly fishing for redfish, we're going with stealth. Stealthy approach is key. You can't be stealthy enough. So if you're fly casting, has a lot of body language and you rock the boat, you're in trouble. Um, we're using the pole. And when we're push pulling our way into an area that looks like it has the potential to hold redfish, I'm looking for wading birds. I'm often looking for waterfowl. I also want to see ospreys in the area and I want to see that bird life active. And the reason that I focus on the bird life is if there's enough prey in that bay or that system or that creek to feed all of these apex predators, then there is enough food in that small ecosystem to support the health and well-being of a sizable school or population of redfish and flounder. When I'm pulling the boat and standing on the platform and easing us through an area, even if I don't know that the fish are there, if I start seeing flounder skip on the bottom out of the shadow of the boat or stingrays fluttering away or later on sometimes sea turtles moving through an area i know that where there is that type of life i'm also going to find redfish and other species it's uh not unlike looking for birds offshore they're just different birds you're looking for your egrets your uh, herons your small least terns these small white birds that plunge feed very quickly. They're a great indicator that there's food resources there that the redfish also survive on. So not just birds, but active birds. Yeah. If they're like roosted up in the trees and they're not feeding. Um, and you see this a lot with fronts moving in, you're probably going to be in for a long fruitless day. Um, any other suggestions for someone, you know, on Google earth or, you know, again, trying to come up with a game plan to put this information into play? Yes. So the safest way to go about this, utilizing your tides, get as shallow as you're comfortable getting with your boat. I'm spending the majority of my day anywhere between 10 and 18 inches of water. I know not everybody is able to do that, but you can certainly kayak in those depths or pull a John boat in those depths. Um, don't be afraid to get rid of the trolling motor. 
you know, and, and go a little quieter into areas. Uh, the other thing that I would tell you is look for clean water. And that can be a relative thing, right? It can be different for different systems of water. But today, for example, when I was guiding, we pushed through an area that we knew the fish should be in. And as soon as we got out of the dirty water that the week's wind had produced in this bay and we got into the clean side, we started seeing fish. And it, it wasn't like we weren't seeing them because of the dirty water. They weren't mudding. We weren't bumping them or pushing them out of the dirty water. They want that clean water the same way we enjoy clean air. And that makes sense. I follow that. Um, how about, and this is where we're talking about how to approach them now. So even using today's example, like you're starting to actually see fish and then there has to be, you know, a great strategy for how to best approach beyond as quiet as you can. Sure. So my general rule is I don't, I don't care if we're fishing a dock and bait fishing or if we're pulling a skiff, I think you should employ stealth in all things. So don't slam your hatches. Don't slam the cooler lid and blare the music. You're just not going to uh, have the best experience as far as catching fish. Uh, the type of fishing that we're doing spring, chasing these redfish in shallow water, they can be really testy in that skinny water because they feel the shock wave of the boat if you move it too quickly, or they hear uh, trolling motor blades ticking the grass or algae on the bottom. And that makes a disturbance or a noise. And we have to remember that noise travels five times faster in water than it does in air. So they can feel and hear those vibrations. Um, the thing that I'm looking for, uh, other than the birds and, and with relation to the shallow water thing, is these redfish with, with the springtime upon us are in massive schools, just like they are in the winter. And when they get together, they tend to feed in a unique way and that unique way is that they wink they literally roll on their sides i've heard it called chafing um, uh, but they roll on their sides to consume prey and if you have any elevation in your boat and you're moving slowly you can see this wink from a long way off and quickly determine okay i've got redfish up there i need to slow down i need to get the wind and light in my favor and i want to approach these fish with caution so that I can catch more than one. If you just go steaming in there on the trolling motor, it could be a one and done experience. So that's interesting. I've never heard the winking. Um, I mean, maybe I've seen it and I just didn't register it. You know, I've, I mean, I've enjoyed the visual pleasure of seeing redfish and are your clients good at seeing the fish too, or how much of it is you telling them, Hey, you need to look at 11 o'clock at, you know, totally. Yeah, so I know, Gary, just from your time on the water and fishing, you have seen mullet flashing in deeper water. Um, and it's kind of got a silver quick, you know, sheen to it. One of the beauties of this spring fishery is the water is crystal clear. Uh, we've got water as clear as the Bahamas or the Keys, typically from the winter all the way up until about May. And then it starts to get a little, you know, different. But this winking behavior is either... Uh, feeding or social. And I've interrogated a lot of redfish and haven't gotten many answers. But most of the time when I see them winking, it's a barn burner of a day. Very few of my anglers uh, have experienced that before or have stalked fish in shallow water the way that we're doing. And so it does take a little bit of guidance and a little bit of coaching to kind of illustrate for them like there it is. But man, once they see it, it's awesome. I'll be pulling and moving and they're like, there's one at 11 and oh, there's one at two and oh, there's another one at three. And now we're just trying to get our parameters. Okay. We got all these fish spread out. We need to find the edges and figure out which way the tide's moving so that we can make a presentation to the fish from up tide. It's nice to swing that fly into the fish versus pull it, you know, a, uh, into them with the tide. It's better to swing the fly down to them on the tide where possible as we strip. But that wink is paramount to success some days. And do uh, does the typical client show a learning curve where they might struggle to see the fish in the water at the beginning of the day or become more adept by the time they leave the boat? I would say um, of the anglers that I've been so fortunate to fish with, if they haven't had this experience before, 
it's simply because they weren't being observant enough or they didn't know to look for this type of um, feeding behavior or trait. Um, it's not surprising that people see fish feeding on the surface because you look at the majority of the shallow you know, saltwater area, you don't see a lot of disturbance on the surface. So if you see something splash or blow up on the surface, that draws your eye. This, this winking behavior does take a little bit more of a concentration on the eye and that you're looking through the water with your polarized lenses, which is why it's so imperative to approach these fish with the sunlight at your back, if possible, or over a shoulder. Um, and a really unique trick and tip that I share with all of my anglers is your polarized lenses, that lens film is oriented, oriented horizontally, right? And that just works with the way we see the world. Sometimes because of the sun angle and the way that it comes down, it's actually best to tilt your head and your eyes or shield the sun with the brim of your hat. And just that little tilt, you know, from your head will actually further polarize the water surface. And that can be the determining factor between seeing a school of 100 or just seeing one fish wink. So, I mean, I think we're at the point, and I'm very curious to see how you're going to answer this question, because there's so many variables into play. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what I would love to have a feel for is, like, all right, we've got some fish, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm grounded, and I'm up in the front of the boat, and I would like you to give me a little bit of what you're thinking and what you're doing, and then what you're telling me, the person in the front of the boat, you know, simultaneously to help us prepare for success to get that to get that first cast, that first redfish hookup? Sure. So I think it's imperative that um, there's good communication from both the back and the front. So if you're seeing a big school for the first time and you get apoplectic on me, we're going to have trouble because <laughs> I need that communication. You know, there's a lot of back and forth. We use the bow of the boat or the skiff. We talk about that just like we would a uh, fighter jet. So the bow is always 12 and not where you're facing. So if you're facing over here, but the bow is the camera, you're looking, you know, off to 11 or one o'clock. So you, I want to set the shot up for the anglers that are right-handed to be between 12 and nine so that they're not casting through the cockpit and hooking me or possibly a guest and for left-handed anglers between 12 and three. So lefties are fishing off the right side of the boat. Right is fishing off the left side of the boat, unless you're super talented and you've got a serious fly game like Billy claims to have, and then you might be able to back cast at the fish. But ultimately, um, the communication is, I tend to think out loud when I'm guiding, and I think it's helpful if you're doing this type of fishing with a buddy that you coach each other and work together and explain like, okay, I just saw a mullet break over here. Um, and I saw some bait scurry over there, or the water's a little funny texture or color over there. That might be something that we need to investigate. And for me, at least, I have been doing this long enough that I have an idea of where the fish should be in different areas at different stages of the tide. I do my best to think out loud and prepare my anglers in advance so we don't get all the jitters. And I remind them quickly, like, hey, we're out here to have fun. We're going to go have a blast. By the way, there's fish pushing up here at one o'clock on the bank, 150 feet. Take a breath. Get your fly in line ready to go. Make sure you're good. And when we get up here, I'm going to spin you for a shot. We're going to catch one of those guys. So in the beginning of our talk, I'm not quite sure I followed, but like the ideal is the client that has 30 to 50 feet of range. Yes. So you want that in all winds. And you want to be able to make a 30 to 50 foot cast, not because fishing guides are jerks trying to make you cast further, but because the fish can feel your presence and they can feel the displacement of the boat being pushed through the water in shallow water, especially they can feel this on their lateral line. Um, and at about the 30 foot range, Somebody standing on an elevated platform in a boat, you know, waving a stick with a brightly colored fly line is really not conducive to a redfish faring pretty well for their safety, right? And they can see you in that clear water. They can feel your vibrations through the boat, the way you move on the vessel. 30 feet tends to be the threshold of comfort that these fish will um, allow. 
before they get spooky and realize that, hey, there's some kind of threat in here and they don't know if it's a dolphin or a shark or, you know, something else that they just don't want to be a part of. At 50 feet, if you make a bad cast to an approaching school, you have time, okay? That's a clock and that clock is ticking. You have time to get out of that bad situation and represent. But if all you have is a 30 foot cast, then you're about the time that you're showing the fly to the fish, their survival alarm is going off. Something doesn't feel right. There's some weird vibrations over here. This pressure wave from this guy casting on this boat feels like a dolphin coming in here to attack us and they're going to spook. The reason I don't want my guests casting typically more than 50 feet is we're at the coast. There's a lot of wind and that fly can veer off. I'm willing to put in the work and pull you closer to make that shot better. I want you to see, visualize that experience. And fly lines have a lot more stretch in them than our light tackle fishing counterparts with braided lines and fluorocarbon leaders. So beyond 50 feet, it's very difficult for most anglers to A, to cast that far and be accurate, and B, to get a good hook purchase or hookup for all of the stretch that's in the fly line. I follow. Okay, that makes sense. And so in this environment, how successful, how much opportunity do you have to keep me from having to battle into the wind and have the wind more as an ally than, than oh my God, how am I going to reach? That is the job of a really good guide. We should be approaching its each situation each location that we're hunting these fish with all of those factors in play in other words um before you and i even leave the dock i have a catalog of places in my brain that it's like nope that one's not going to work that one's not going to work because the light's wrong or the wind's coming out of the west or it's coming out of the east so it's a constant chess game i think i feed on that challenge i really enjoy that but you have to consider the angler's abilities. So if you have an angler who only has a 30 foot cast and only in a forward cast setup, you know, between 12 and nine or 12 and three, then that angler success ratio just shrunk to this. Okay. It's almost like golfers. If you can't drive the ball or you can't pump the ball, you're only playing half the game. But if you take an angler who can consistently in let's say 12 knots of wind or less, make 50 feet with their cast, either forward or backhanded cast, that angler is going to catch 75% more fish than the previous one we talked about that has a 30 foot cast. That's the difference between somebody not catching a fish and not being prepared and an angler who is very prepared and has put in the time and the work like a good athlete and that guy is probably going to have a five fish day, which by all the standards, wherever you catch redfish from Texas, Mexico, all the way up to us is a great day on fly. But some of those anglers that I've fished with have had 20 fish days or more. And you said something earlier that I, I knew I was going to ask again or ask about if you didn't bring it up. But it, so we're seeing some fish and you're saying that the ideal cast is allowing the fly to swing into the fish, not put it right on top right. of them. And I guess I'm also asking, and I'm sure it relates to this question. I mean, if I'm seeing a bunch of fish, is it is it like duck hunting? Like, don't just shoot into the flock. I want you to pick out your fish. Is is that part of this game? Yes. Yeah, so this is the the main difference between this is we are fishing in a very surgical fashion or a very technical fashion to a specific fish. It's often the lead fish or the second or third tier row in a schooling scenario um, and the reason that we're not flock shooting uh, is your fly line is big and bulky and has a much larger diameter than braid or monofilament or anything else and so it's going to cast a shadow and it doesn't matter if you're trout fishing uh, with a fly rod in the mountains or you're fishing on the coast for a saltwater species like redfish if your fly line cuts through the middle of a school of redfish they're gone you're going to see them part no pun intended, like the Red Sea. And you're going to be looking at license plates and a dust cloud and thinking about, okay, where can I take this individual to uh, start over and, um, you know, find another fresh school that we haven't 
foot on alert. To answer your other question about the feeding angle, the best feeding angle is not dead 90 degrees right in front of the fish's face, but more of a 45 degree angle where it sweeps and is going away from the fish as you retrieve the fly. That engages their prey predator relationship. We have many, many fewer bites from a fly that charges a fish and comes right at their face because prey does not attack predator. And we get many, many more bites on a variety of different species, but especially with redfish where that fly is presented down tide and kind of at a 45 degree angle. It's the sweet spot, so to speak. It's where they want to feed. You could do the same thing with a jerk bait and have the same results. You'll get a grab versus throwing it boom right on their head. And I know that my audience likes specifics. And so if I didn't ask this, someone would perhaps put this in the comment, but give me your suggestion for an all around fly, of course, different ones in different scenarios. But if we're talking about an all around fly and then quick thoughts on leader. Yeah. So uh, one of my favorite flies that you could travel anywhere with and catch a variety of species, salt and fresh was actually tied for fishing in the keys for bonefish. Uh, it comes in a variety of colors, and I like tan, but it's Tim Borsky's pattern. He's a marine artist in the Keys, and it's called Borsky's Bonefish Slider. And you could literally have a one-fly season where the, all you did was fish that fly in a variety of sizes and colors for everything from smallmouth to big, hungry, aggressive brown trout. Uh, turn around and use it for bonefish. I've caught tarpon on it. And... Um, redfish and a variety of other species and you just manipulate the size to make sure that it correlates to the target species that you're chasing thoughts on leader yeah so leaders i actually prefer to fish with monofilament leaders and I typically i'm going to start with a nine foot leader just out of a package um, i'm using rio leaders i just like that product you cast really well in the wind and um, on the very bottom end of that monofilament leader i'll cut what fly fishermen call the tippet or the bitter end. I'll cut about a foot of that narrow finished diameter, which will be anywhere from 16 to 20 pound test. And I will blood knot in about a foot or three feet of 16 pound fluorocarbon. Not only does that fluorocarbon allow the fly to penetrate the water surface and carry it down and get it in the strike zone a little quicker, but you have the added abrasion resistance and that last little bit of terminal zone, in theory, is invisible because the fluorocarbon has the same uh, optical density as water, which makes it disappear or vanish. Um, how about, and I'm, I think we're coming to the, I think we're getting ready to move into like some summation thoughts on etiquette, but yeah. I've gotten my fly reasonably in the right you've got me in the right position i've got my fly landing in the right position again every scenario is different but some general advice some general thoughts for the action on the fly yeah absolutely i like a strip that is very short and if you've got any musicians they'll appreciate this but i i tell my anglers i want a very staccato which is kind of quick and short um, bup, 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 very punctuated. I want to strip the fly short and make it look twitchy or nervous, but I don't want to move it very far. So if you can get four pulsating strips in a foot, that's not as good as 10. If you can get 10 pulsating strips in a foot of retrieve of the fly, they're going to respond to that better. Uh, the main difference between the fly and so much of our conventional equipment with light tackle is it's made out of fur and feathers. And so the general properties of all those materials are that they breathe, you know, and for over a hundred years, a bucktail jig has been a great tool. We use a lot of those types of materials in the flies. Um, any other thoughts before we move to the etiquette portion of this discussion? No, I think we covered that pretty good. Don't get bogged down, mired down in flies. Uh, spend your time practicing your cast, getting uh, really competent with your cast, and you know, seek out somebody in your community or local fly club or a guide that you like who you know is proficient with teaching casting and get some casting instruction if you feel like there's something to learn because it's going to make your time on the water more enjoyable. And it's the one thing that you can do now 
uh, and forever to stay sharp and prepare and you'll have a much better experience when you're on the water than being frustrated with your equipment. What about etiquette? What did you have in mind with our etiquette conversation? Yeah, so um, this is something that I feel like we should all do a better job of just as fishermen, um, especially in a shallow water setting where you see somebody pulling a boat. The worst thing that I can have happen to me or that I can do to someone else who has spent a lot of time like a kayak paddling to a location to fish is run by them with the motor wide open or close or idle by. Um, Worse still is to pull up behind somebody who's clearly pulling a boat and visually is at a disadvantage because everybody can see what they're doing. And if I was to pull in on somebody and camp out and sling my anchor overboard while they're pulling and trying to quietly stealthily stalk fish, I've just ruined all of their opportunities. It would be similar to uh, hunting in the deer woods and having a bunch of people ride through on their four wheelers. So just messed up their hunt. Um, The idea is I know that I want to be friendly to everybody on the water, but I'm also going to give people a lot of distance and not just because of COVID. uh, But I feel like all of us are seeking out a quiet retreat on the water. And the last thing that I want to do is fish elbow to elbow with everyone else. So it all comes down to courtesy. And the way that I gauge this is if I can see the make and model of your boat, or if I can identify it, or I know what kind of motor you have and you're pulling or fishing in shallow water, I'm too close. If I'm moving into a Creek and I see somebody on a pole and I, maybe I want to go past them to get to an area that I think the fish are in and and they're not in the right location. I'm going to turn around and leave. There's absolutely no reason for me to ruin that person's, you know, precious time working the fish. And I do the same thing when I see somebody in an area that I want to fish and they're running a trolling motor or anchored up. Um, I'd say the only exception that we all take into consideration with this is trout fishing at anchor, where we're all just kind of very, you know, uh, community style fishing or on the jetties. This is a very different situation. Um, Seth, this has been great. I've enjoyed this conversation. Me too. Um, and where I'm going now, let me see. I just lost my thought. So as far as the Seth Vernon and Double Hall Guide Service, we've been focusing on spring redfish and spring redfish on the fly and fly by far is your specialty. How about a quick walk through the calendar? Like what else are you targeting? What, uh, what other species can you put on people's list of I've accomplished that on the fly? Like walk me through the calendar. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously the state fish, the red drum or redfish, as we like to call them, they're here year round. They're a wonderful target. They do all the sexy, fun, cool stuff that you could ever want to experience on the fly and they pull hard. Um, From there, uh, we kind of transition into summer. Uh, We've had some really good seasons with big chopper blues. Those are an absolute hoot on the fly. You don't have to make the best presentation. In fact, you can throw big gaudy topwater flies and chug them on the surface and get these beautiful, vicious uh, topwater aggression strikes. So those are a terrific species starting in like late April, early May. And you'll find those fish uh, not only in our inlets and on the jetties, but any of these small uh, creeks or tributaries that feed the waterway or um, inlet creeks that feed the waterway. If you get a good hard charging tide, look at those tide rips, look at those edges and look for them visually busting on the surface and man, hang on they're They're super fun. Uh, From there, we do target flounder on the fly. They hit artificials just fine. And in the shallow water, uh, when you see them percuss and strike, it's often fun to just quickly sling a fly in that direction. And then uh, instead of that fast pulsating strip, we're just kind of dragging the fly very gently across the fly or across the bottom while wiggling the rod tip. So it makes that fly quiver, but you're dragging it slowly across the bottom and boom, we catch a lot of flounder on that fly that I mentioned, Borsky's bonefish slider. So we'll catch flounder through the summer with these other two fish. Uh, Ladyfish are absolute blast. If uh, you're prone to sunburn and don't like crowds, nighttime fishing for ladyfish, uh, urban settings around the dock lights, little shrimp gurglers on the surface, we call them the poor man's tarpon. They're an absolute blast in the summer months. 
uh, cobia on the fly, uh, mahi mahi when they come in, you know, to the near shore waters, uh, the bonita in the spring, uh, tarpon in the summer. I had one of my anglers catch a tarpon on fly last year on 16 pound tippet. That was epic, about 70 pounds. Uh, false albacore in the fall, Spanish kings. Uh, and then back into the late fall, the trout start moving in. They're absolute riot on fly. And, um, yeah, we catch sheep's head and black drum and pretty much anything you would catch on artificial. All right. I'm going to put my list together and then I'm going to give you a call and we're going to open up a calendar. I like it. Man, Seth, it has been a pleasure talking to you. I love talking fishing when it's a mix of part art, part craft, part science. And that is certainly what I believe I've experienced here tonight. Man, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing. Thank you very much, Gary. Appreciate you guys You're doing a great thing. And I uh, look forward to hearing more of the work you're putting out with the podcast. This is fantastic. Thanks, man. Gary, Gary, Gary. Oh my gosh, dude. Does Seth know what he's talking about? Oh, uh, yeah. Every, I mean, every it, detail thought out. You know, I came from, yeah, it was beautiful, man. I was like, wow, this dude is like a paint. He's like the, what is that? Never mind. I'm not going to compare him to the, whatever that dude's name is, the art dude. <laughs> Never mind. The art dude. <laughs> Bob Ross. He's like the Bob Ross of fly fishing. You know, Bob Ross makes it look easy. Like, I cannot yes. wait. I just texted my father in law and said, this guy, I actually sent him a screenshot. I'm like, this guy, we're going fishing with him. Actually, when we stop the recording, I'm going to go, when can we book it? He's coming in. My father-in-law's coming in next week as we're recording this. So we'll see what happens. But, dude, my biggest takeaway is when you ask him, what is, like, the kind of the one go-to fly? I even mouthed it, like, clouds are minnow. Like, every fly fisherman on the coast of North Carolina that I've asked, what is one fly I should try and get? Ooh, clouds are minnow. And when he said that Borski bonefish slider – I immediately just Googled it, ordered some, <laughs> sent the link to my father-in-law. I was like, here you go. This is, we're right going to try this. So I get stoked about that kind of stuff, man. So that epic episode. And, uh, you know, for somebody who comes from the freshwater world of fly fishing to, like, really, you know, learn all that stuff, man. I mean, I'm, I'm on Google Maps. I'm on everything, like, <laughs> following it as I'm watching a seminar. So... Uh, there was a couple times I was going to be like, Gary, I got a, I got a question. Hold on. <laughs> but I didn't. I was like, this show must go on. It's too good. But, oh, man. Yeah. Anyway, you can tell I really love that. <laughs> I am. I'm juiced. I was already juiced, and somehow I'm more juiced now. And then when he's like, you can catch every species of fish on a fly, I'm like, all right, challenge accepted. Like, I need to figure this out, man. So, anyway, I- I'm excited to learn more from him when we uh, book him on his boat, for sure. <laughs> right on, man. <laughs> it's happening. I don't know when. But, anyway. Um, well, where are we at, Gary? We're wrapping up. <laughs> I got no bad jokes to make. Nothing, huh? I, that you, right. you, that you just gave us the perfect right. end to the episode. Perfect, man. man. Well, enjoy it, and uh, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it as well. Thank you, Marine Warehouse, Academy Sports, RA Hitch, for being supporters of the show, and be sure to go support those businesses as they support us. And yeah, Gary, that's it, man. Yeah, man. As I say, Marine Warehouse Center, parts, service, sales, all of it, man. Those guys are a big part of the fishing community making efforts to be in the fishing community. We love them, and we thank all our sponsors. And, Billy, we'll be talking to you in a week. Yep, sounds good. It's never been easier to get on the water with a cat. Fishing.